Good morning and welcome to the service of worship from the Pendleton Presbyterian Church. We are glad you're here this morning. We hope God will grant us all a blessing. Now, for those of you who have always wanted, but have never had an opportunity to sit on the front row, today's your chance. <laughs> I don't see any movement. <laughs> Come on, Jimmy. <laughs> Please uh, remember Julie Wardlaw and her family in your thoughts and prayers. As you know, her mother, Susie Smoke, passed away, and there will be a service uh, here at the church on January the 6th at 1 p.m. Are there other announcements that, <clears throat> excuse me, that should be made? Let us then begin to worship. Sixty-one in the red hymnal, Joy to the World. <clears throat>
Please refer to your bulletin for the prayer of confession, and let us pray together. O God of forgiveness, with our mouths we speak against your word and for our own words. We show disobedience to your commands. Suspicion breeds hostility. You open our eyes to your righteousness, yet remain blind to our Lord's forgiving. Forgive us, and in Christ hear our prayer. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Our Bible tells us of the one who shall come and reveals God's will for our lives. In Jesus, we have assurance that our call for forgiveness brings God's grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. seated. Our prayer of dedication is also in your bulletin, our prayer dedicating our gifts <clears throat> to God. And so referring to that, let us offer this prayer. Our God, in your sight, we offer our gifts. Use them to help spread the news that Jesus brings. Help us to break down whatever barriers divide us. Hear us as we dedicate ourselves anew to becoming your agents of peace. Amen. You may remain seated for this hymn. It is number 163.
reading this morning from the Old Testament is from the book of Isaiah, and I shall read to you not from the 62nd chapter, but rather from the 61st chapter regarding the good news of deliverance. Hear the word of God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, <clears throat> and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise, instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the plantings of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love peace. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. <clears throat> I will give faithfully them their <clears throat> recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offsprings among the peoples. And all who see them will acknowledge that they are the people whom the Lord has blessed. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And now let us come before our God in prayer, praying the prayers that you have within your hearts. Let us pray together. And now let us join together in a moment of common prayer. Our gracious God, you have brought us through the Advent season and the Spirit of Christ is with us as we celebrate his birth. <clears throat> we thank you for the joy of the season, for the times of our families <clears throat> and friends, for offerings to put in our hearts and its true meaning of the season within our lives for you sustain our lives by the gifts of the earth, the loving people who surround us, and <clears throat> by the hope which uh, continues to surge in our hearts for ourselves, our country, and the peoples of the world. We rejoice to know and to lift our hearts in praise that your purposes for us and all creation are peace and plenty, life, and joy. So we bless your name, and we would not forget all of your benefits for us, your children. Hear our silent thanksgivings that we have offered as we share the prophet's vision of a time when swords will indeed be turned into plowshares, tanks into trains, and guns into useful tools. Hasten the day, we pray, when justice is the rule and war is the furthest from all of our thoughts. <clears throat> Increase our feelings of kinship with everyone on earth and put in all of our hearts and minds that the glad day when we turn all of our powers into enhancing your good. Assist us by our time together now through your spirit that we might never lose heart but see clearly the future you gave us in Christ in whose name we pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
I apologize for my voice this morning. Um, I don't know what happened to it between uh, 10 o'clock and, and now, but anyway, bear with me. Our reading this morning from the Gospel of Matthew is taken from the third chapter, verses 1 through 14, or 1 through 12. The proclamation of John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit and be worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, our ancestor. I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water, but one who is coming more powerful than I is coming to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And we pray in the spirit of our living Christ that our understanding might be added. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon to you about John the Baptist. And this season, for whatever reason, I've become fascinated with John all over again because he is indeed the one who proclaims Christ, the voice crying in the wilderness. And it's fascinating the way that his life began to unfold from the announcement to his mother with his father's silence to where he ate locusts and wild honey and dressed in furs and lived in the desert. And all of the writers of the early, in the early church and, and of the, the New Testament, they were aided by John because he was their call for Israel to be aware that the one promise was indeed now within their presence. And that early church realized the value of what John had done and the prominent role that he played in the life of announcing Jesus as the Messiah. The gospel reports that John stirred the nation of Israel to begin to repent, and that people, as I read to you, came from Jerusalem and all of the region of Judea, and they were baptized by him with water, and many of them repented of their sins and a following began for Jesus even before he appeared immediately on the scene. But John realized it was not very easy to convince people to repent, or rather, instead of using a word like repentance, to begin to think differently about themselves and to begin to think differently about their neighbors, even the hated Samarians. It is not easy, the book of Genesis tells us, for individuals to confess up to their acts. Recall I just read to you recently about 
the serpent and Adam and evil and when Eve gave Adam the apple and he ate and then the conflict that occurred when God appeared walking in the cool of the evening and they began to deny, they tried to evade, they tried to avoid God by hiding, by making themselves some things to cover themselves out of fig leaves. And I think that's just the way that we human beings usually, all, almost always, react to those things within us that pose a threat to other people seeing who we really are and to who we admit to ourselves that we really are. We try to deny it. And when that fails, we resort to shifting the responsibility to someone else if we can find someone to shift it to. Which makes what John did all the more remarkable for me back in that first century. Somehow, this uneducated man living on locusts and wild honey in the desert alone like perhaps a recluse or a monk, could command all of these people's attention. That is fascinating to me. Somehow, he managed to get through these patterns that I've just mentioned to you of denial and got people to do the most important thing that they could do for themselves in that given moment. And that was to face up to the darkness within them and to accept the light that was coming into their lives and began to do something about it by being baptized with water and confessing their sins. And that is so much more healthy, I think, than denying. But how did he do it? Well, first of all, he got them good and scared. <laughs> he pointed to a God who was moving toward an awesome judgment that waited all sinners and that is true he was and some people I'm sure were indeed caught up in fear about this talk of damnation but that matter is not easily settled with only that one observation we must be careful to understand and I think John understood this clearly and I think he communicated this to the people certainly Jesus did, that God is caring. He is not non-caring because if you don't care, that's the very opposite of love. It's the very opposite of being involved in life for yourself and for other people. But God, God cares. It's why John spoke as he did. I think he believed in a God that was passionately involved in the drama of creation and that God has not avoided nor given up upon his creation because when God created the world it was not just a casual act you know something let's plant something here and see if it'll grow no that was not in God's intent at all he didn't say well let's do this and see what happens God was serious about other creatures coming to experience something of his own joy of being alive and having the opportunity to grow and to share a life with others and to have others share their lives with them. I believe that God deliberately designed our world to achieve that very end. It's what righteousness is all about. It's about the world working so that part of God's joy can become your joy. Sin is the opportunity that we use to take God's will apart and begin to try and put it all back together again to suit our very own needs not what God is calling us to. And inevitably, chaos will result. Now, when chaos does result, 
It does not mean that God gets frustrated and throws a temper tantrum, for that's not the biblical concept of God and God's wrath at all. Wrath is always used in terms of reverence. It is not anger. It is not passionate anger, but rather reverence of standing back and seeing and seeking what is indeed before you. The image of a jealous God is not the one that we find in the Bible. In John's world, there were many people who were denying the order of creation. Perhaps they were uninformed at that point. I don't know. There are many people today in this world that are denying God's creation and trying to substitute their own will for the will of God. And you see what our shape our world is in. According to the Old Testament, the fear or reverence of the Lord is respect for the way that our world is put together. And when we do recognize that, we are told that that is for us the beginning of wisdom. You don't begin to understand God as a God of love until you begin to reckon with the seriousness of God's commitment to be your God and for you to have a share of God's joy. That joy was created and placed within each and every one of us. Yet we have turned it away and turned it off many, many times. But I believe we all hope and seek at our deepest level to turn that commitment back on to the joy of God and God's created order. Now, in all fairness to John, I have to note that his message was not all negative. In addition to warning, he also spoke of hope. He pointed to the one who was coming who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. That was God, uh, John's way of saying that God has not ever, ever given up on his creation. Indeed, God was sending one who could heal all of the brokenness, all of the darkness of our lives and our world, if we would let him. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the way that John speaks of the one who was just now coming. And there is no way that I can overstate what this one can do in setting right what has gone wrong in individual lives and in the life of our world if we will admit our need and grant Jesus to come into our darkness. John spread the word that there was one who was indeed coming to do this very thing, baptizing with the Holy Spirit, the one who would take away your sins by creating an atmosphere of honesty and also of expectation. John prepared the way of the Lord so that when Jesus did indeed arrive, there were some who were already ready for him to come into their lives. And I think if our Lord is going to do anything significant for us ever, is not this the same kind of essential attitude that we must have? For not even God can do anything about our brokenness and our world's brokenness if we refuse to acknowledge and grant God access to it. But then again, if we do, there is nothing that God cannot do if we offer access. This season of Advent and Christmas, we have heard again the good news. The word is out. There is one who can help. No, it's on the way, but already here. The time, we are told, is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand for each and every one of us. 
there is one who can do something with just about everything in our lives and in our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And now, if you would, please rise and let us say what we believe by repeating together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn is number 165. Know as you leave the sanctuary and carry it within your hearts that there is indeed one who can do something with just about everything. Go in his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 